I'm not going to go through the entire list of tools that we have. Uh, I'm only going to go through about four or five of them. And I'm going to tell you a bit about what, you can, what else you can use them for. And this is just going to be a really quick rundown. So uh, the first thing I'm going to go through is the f plotting some free energy profiles to, in order to actually track your uh, pro progress of your simulations. So really quick, um, just want to go through the required libraries and programs. Um, as Matt mentioned, Anaconda Python distribution is what you want. Uh, these, the three libraries that you want is included in all of that. Uh, of course, you need Vespa and Gromax because uh, this is interface with the tutorial that Adam has presented. So it actually will come packaged with the data that you were you would get if you ran that simulation for about 70 iterations or so. Um, so I'm going to start with very similar initial setup. Go to whatever you want. It actually is self-contained. Um, if you were if you had ran the P53 tutorial, you could have used that HY file. That's what my plan was. But because we don't have it, you can go anywhere you want uh, to your home folder and clone this. On this repo. Uh, just CD in there, and it, there are two ways to go about this. Uh, because I knew everybody would be tired, I packaged package it with some uh, bash ba scripts. So if you want, you can just listen and then run all their three parts. You can run the first one, the second one, the third one, however you please. And if, well, if you want, you can follow along and try to run the commands that I'm going to show you. It's up to you. Um, so. Let's start with some free energy profiles. Uh, this is just going to be a first uh, one-dimensional free energy surface, uh, free energy profile. This is an evolution over the weighted ensemble iterations, and this is just a two-dimensional one. So, so the first one is average. The second yeah. one is, is as a function of time as instead a, of the as a function of weighted ones. ensemble iterations. And the last one is averaged over a certain iteration window of two, two dimensions. So the first tool is WPDIS, which actually generates histograms. So what this does is, this is only a select uh, set of options. If you want to see the entire documentation, what you want to do is uh, write source load env at that sh. Uh, there's a load env environment script that I wrote. You can source that and then run this command, WPDIS um, under dash h, which should give you an entire documentation of every option. And I'm not going to go through every option. I just want to go through some of the major ones. Um, but w, dash w, cap, capital W, uh, takes in the master HY file. Then you can give a first iteration and last iteration. Uh, you can give the histogram in bins, or just the number of bins, and it will find uh, bins automatically for you. Uh, the number that I like for this is about 200 for larger, larger um, coordinates. This will change the resolution of the final graph. Um, and of course, you can change around however you please. What did you say? Source what again? Just source end? load that underscore n. There should be a, a script called on, uh, um, load n that is h. If you source that, oh, that I should see. that should load in all the all the right things. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the input data? Is everything contained in that h by by file? So or does it have, need those trajectories? Um, this does not need any of the trajectories. What this does is it will take the progress coordinate. Um, from the H5 file, uh, it actually, uh, you can, I'm going to show here, this construct data set uh, option, you can give it a Python function, which can pull arbitrary data sets in. Uh, I will talk about that in a second, but what this only uses from the H5 file, if you only gave the H5 file, is the progress coordinates. Technically speaking, I don't know if this is correct, but you can probably have an H5 file that is structured the same way as the H5 file. And that should work fine. That, that's what I, I was wondering. But what sort of stuff? Like, do you know the, where the trajectory start and end, or just the end point? For example? Uh, it has the entire. The H5 file contains every data that you pulled from the simulation. So if you have, say, for example, twenty. So you know the start bins and the end bins for each trajectory. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. And you can. H5 file anything contains all of that. In the H5 file. Yeah, but it has to be organized the correct way. Yeah. So if we have some other way of doing sampling, we can still use these tools. Yes. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. Right. absolutely. Yes. That's that's what I was going to come in the next slide, actually. So one of the nicest things about this tool is this last option, construct data set. What this does is, as long as you can put your uh, data properly in a file, any format you want, and if you can open it with Python, you can actually feed it into this tool, which is what I'm going to show in a second. So I, I'm, I wanted to show like a, an example um, command here. You can run this. If you want the, the first part, the first uh, part one that I say, if you look in your folder, you will see, you will see 
It's a long file named part1.sh. It contains the, the, the commands that you want. And it contains this one as well. So what this is going to do is going to take in the master file. It's going to give a Python function. And that's how you basically um, give a Python function in assignment.py. And the function name is pull underscore data. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. How do you actually write this Python function? So um, the Python function ha is going. This is what this is. What this is going to have to do is during every iteration, if you give uh, construct data set option this particular um, this particular function, it will load in the function, and in every iteration, it will uh, run this function before doing any histogramming. And basically, this this function has to take in the this is an integer that gives the number of, number of iteration that it's on. And this is a Python object, iter group, which is actually contained in the h5py library. If you want to look more about, learn more about the, the group's properties, you need to look into, into that one. But uh, suffice it to say, what you have to do is uh, the iter group actually takes, um, can be indexed for, for the data that you have in the h5 file. So basically, you can think about this as, say, iteration one, um, in your h5 file, and you can look into whatever you have in the h5 file in iteration one. So Adam has stored the end-to-end -end distances, and it named he named it this way, and that's automatically put into OPS data end-to-end dist. And here I'm just basically pulling this end-to-end -end distance uh, data completely. Uh, and I'm also taking the first dimension of the progress coordinate. Adam mentioned he actually has color as a second coordinate. I'm only pulling the RMSD here. This is the high heavy Adam RMSD. This pulls in the heavy atom RMSD and this pulls in the end distances. And then it has to be shaped properly. So what do I mean by that? This basically has first the number of walkers, the segment ID, and the second index is going to be your time in, in the index, and the last one has the data. The data, if you have, say, for example, two-dimensional data, in this case, it has to be stacked together. And so this numpy ID stack is a, is a kind of a quick way of actually shaping it correctly. So, say, if you wanted to reach um, your segment number five, um, the time point number five, and like the first dimension, you would index this by five by one, for example. So that's how this data is returned to the actual histogramming function. So what you can imagine doing here is you can, for example, import any library that you want. If you want some text file, for example, if you, if you want to pull from a text file, you can pull from a text file and shape it correctly and feed it back in, and that should actually still work, as long as you shape that correctly. Uh, it could be in another file format, it, it could be like a pickled NumPy file, whatever you want. As long as you can read it in with, uh, with Python, you can actually put it in. Of course, you know, if you're constantly reading files, it might, it might be a little slower, but it should still work. So if the Walker index is sort of an arbitrary number, it's, it's a trajectory. Yes, it's a trajectory. Say, for example, in, in the file system, if you remember, there's iteration one, and then there's a bunch of uh, uh, internal IDs for all, every walker. Right. It's actually um, it's just an ID for a trajectory. It's just, yeah. it's just an and ID for a trajectory. Index. And the time index is each trajectory has, say, five time points. You're returning, say, five time points for each trajectory. It's basically the time index is that those five. Uh, you can return one. You can return five if you want. You can return 100. It's up to you. Um, you can't okay. return one, actually. Oh, yeah. You can't return one. Of course, the first one is always the, 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 the number for the previous one. So it has to be at least two. That's true. So, um, but that's, so that's most commonly two? Um, for, personally, I've never used two. I've usually used 20, depending on the situation. I tend to pull, for example, every 20 picoseconds for my simulations, uh, every one picosecond for my simulations. And my tau, for example, is usually 20 picoseconds. I like to store every 20, every 20 data points for each. Okay, so you are looking inside the trajectory. Yes. Yes. It's the resolution is the whatever resolution you want. The, the oh, but it's not opening any trajectory file. It's not actually accessing the file system. Just, this this is all stored in the H5 file. This is a, like when you return the progress coordinate in run seg, like that gets stored in the H5 file. And this is just pulling it from the H5 file. Well, that's already happened. So this is not running on any file uh, in the file system. It's just opening up an H5 file that already has all the stored data in it. You, you could pull your H5 file and do this. like You could pull your H5 file to like your laptop. Yeah, I understand that. But for when you're doing the weight ensemble splitting, merging, all that, you're only looking at the 
endpoint. Mm. Do that. Yes. The split and merging algorithm. You're looking at the side of the trajectory. Yes. 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 Split merge only happens at the last endpoint. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions? Cool. Uh, so the second tool is um, a, another flexible tool that can plot, uh, that has a couple of different modes. This is basically designed to uh, plot the actual functions, the, the histograms that you pulled in. Um, it has three modes, average, evolution, and instantaneous. The instantaneous one actually um, plots it over a single iteration, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about average and evolution. Um, the average one averages over a certain iteration window. Evolution shows it shows the evolution over the certain number of weighted ensemble iterations. It takes in a range, which it gives you the uh, range of depending on how you want to. There's a couple of different modes. You can actually plot the probabilities, free energy, free energies, which is the negative log of probabilities, um, or just the histograms and frequency. Uh, so the range just basically determines the range of the, in the act y-axis. So say for example, you want only zero to tan kT uh, for a the default mode is the free, free energy, so zero to tan kT. Uh, the HDF5 output is uh, is is an optional one. You can output all of this into an HDF5 file if you want to actually later on analyze it yourself. Uh, you don't have to do this. This will output some form of um, PNG PDF, whatever you give it. Uh, the first iter, last iter, as I mentioned, is the same thing. And the plot output is basically the output that you want with the right extension. So if you want a PNG, some file name dot PNG or PDF, some file name dot PDF will get you the right format. Uh, that's, this is all handled through matplotlib, so if you want to learn more about this, you want to look at matplotlib. So one thing about this, I suggest you do uh, PNGs instead. And then because you ac access Frank using X11 forwarding, you should be able to do EOG the file name and look at your uh, look at your plots. So if you want to do it yourself, you can do it yourself. If you don't want to do it yourself, just run the first part of the, the shell script of the first one. That should produce three PNGs, and you can look through as I'm as I'm describing it. Don't you need the weights to compute this? That already is in the H5 file. So that actually hand, was handled during the histogramming section. Histogramming section actually takes into the, it takes the weights into account when it's histogramming. Oh, one little note is this last one is the uh, the probability distributions that I plotted using the WP disk, and this last index is the dimensionality that I want. So I'm actually plotting the zeroth dimension. If you remember, I have returned progress coordinate first and auxiliary data second. So this is basically going to plot a one-dimensional <laughs> average plot, average free energy profile of the RMSD coordinate. So let me just flash it out. Oh, oh, one last thing. I almost forgot. I want to say one more thing, and this is a very another really nice customizability uh, of this tool, is that this post process function. This post-process function is uh, has a similar syntax as, as I mentioned previously to the um, to the construct data set. It uh, this is there's there's a Python file called plotting.py and under that there's an average underscore one D uh, function defined, which looks something like this. So this is a function that is returned after the plotting is done by matplotlib. So if you know a little bit matplotlib, you can basically write your own uh, function. And that will take in the already plotted figure and does whatever you want to it. So this is a way to actually customize, quickly customize whatever figures you have. Say, for example, you want to plot bin boundaries over it. You can actually plot bin boundaries over this. So it takes in histograms, middle points of the histograms, and the bin boundaries. And you can basically then import matplotlib.plt. This, this is a very common thing if you know it, a little bit of matplotlib. I don't want to go over it too much. But this basically gives you a way uh, of e to easily manipulate the current figure that you have. And this is run right after the figure is plotted, so you can basically do whatever you want after the figure is plotted. So I'm here I'm just changing the title. I'm changing two labels. This is a very simple one, but you can actually do whatever you want with this. You can plot, as I said before, like for example, you can take these beam boundaries and plot, um, plot vertical lines for each beam boundary. So uh, last time I'm going to flash this, and I'm going to show you the plot. So this is what it, what it looks like roughly. Uh, this is throughout the entire simulation. 
this is actually 77, 77 iterations. That was what it was at the time that I was plotting this. So this is throughout the entire uh, simulation. So you know that this simulation reached up to like seven, RM, seven angstroms in RMSD, and the lowest point was about one. Uh, and this is just a free energy surface over that, over that heavy on RMSD. Any questions about that? And as you can see, it actually has the right labels and axes and so on and so forth. Um, this is very nice for, my, in my opinion at least, that's why what I've been using this for is quick plots, um, quick reports, and so on and so forth. Um, this is not super suitable for publication quality graphs, but what you can do is output this in PDF or any kind of vector format that Matplotlib supports, and then open it up in uh, some vector graphics and I'll, uh, some vector graphics uh, tool, and then just edit it as you want. That's how I personally get publication quality graphs. That's my preferred method, basically. So moving over to a evolution graph, this is the second mode that I use pretty, pretty frequently uh, of Plathist. It's very similar. Uh, it's only changing the average to evolution, and I'm doing the same thing. What this is going to return is an evolution of that probability distribution over the weighted ensemble iteration. So I can track the progress of my simulation, um, how much sampling I have in that particular direction as the simulation is progressing, particularly speaking. Can you remind me what the starting state is? This is, this is still the future case. Right? This is still exactly yeah. the same simulation. So, so it's a starting coil. Coil. Starting from the bound, the helical okay. convolution. Yeah. So uh, in, the, it, in the beginning, if you look at your, um, I think everybody's ready for the evolution graph. If you look here, you're basically starting from a single point, and then as the simulation progresses, you have more and more sampling in the higher regions of the RMSD. Um, so finally, I want to move on to the two-dimensional ones. This is, um, to me, has been very, very useful, especially for figuring out um, orthogonal coordinates. You can plot the two. You can see they're completely orthogonal um, for defining state bound, state definitions, stuff like that. It's been really nice for me at least. It works on the average averaging mode and basically all you need to do is add the second dimension at the end. And when you, once you add the second dimension at the end, it basically knows that, okay, I'm going to do a, a, a heat map over these two dimensions. So it basically takes in the same arguments except that's that last dimensionality change. Um, so what this is going to do is that it's going to plot the free energy profile versus the RMSD, and then the second one is the end-to-end -end distance. This is what I returned to the WP list, so that's, that's what it's going to have. But I'm going to really quickly mention, first of all, as you go higher in RMSD, this is kind of like anti-correlated, you have uh, lower and lower end-to-end -end distances, as kind of you would expect. And you have, uh, I basically am going to calculate the rates into everything up of, um, from higher than six. I'm just saying this for um, future. I'm going to be doing rate calculations in a second. So I'm going to be calculating everything into uh, the six. And then the second thing I'm going to do, I'm going to calculate the rates from everything from here into this like small little region over there, which is mostly orthogonal. If you only did end-to-end -end distances, you would not see these two, by the way. Um, sorry, if you only did the progress coordinate RMSD, you would actually not see these, which is the nice thing. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to calculate a state-to-state -state state -state rate, if you didn't use the second dimension of the end, the end distance, you would not be seeing, you would not be able to define it properly. Um, this is one of the main uses that I personally use it for. I, I know that there are multiple things that are affecting my process. I plot it for the second one and refine, refine, refine my state, state definitions appropriately. So, speaking of which, I would like to go over to the actually uh, estimating the rate constants. Um, so for this one, I'm going to show you three new tools. Um, the first one is WSI, the second one is WKinetics, and the last one is WKinAverage. WSI, what it does, it takes in your simulation data, it takes in a binning over the simulation data, and it, take, and it basically assigns every data point, every single data point you have in your simulation, uh, or every single data point you feed into the WSI, let's put it that way, so it can actually assign arbitrary data as long as you can shape it appropriately again. It will assign everything into separate bins. And you define your own bins, you define your own states, and you give it the data that you want to give it. So, which is really, really nice. Let's really quickly mention what, how that goes. 
So um, again, uh, dash H for a full documentation for everything. I'm going to only go through the important ones. You're going to give W assign the H5, the master H5 file you have. There are three options, and I'm going to only going to talk about bins from file because that's the most flexible one. If you don't give anything to these to these options, it will use bins from system by default, which is the bins that you have defined for your uh, propagation. So you have defined a certain binning for your propagation to increase your sampling. It will only use those as the binning for the for the assignment. So uh, this is nice if if on, the only thing you're doing is bin over the actual propagation bins. But the the, the nicest thing about this is that it, it, you can take in any kind of data set and bin it on any kind of any kind of binning. Uh, so I, I want to mention particularly this one, which is the most flexible one. Similarly for the states from a file, um, if you don't give anything by default, uh, I don't think it work. doesn't work. <laughs> don't give states. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so it fails. Yes. <laughs> so basically, if you don't have a file for states, you want to define it using states. But I suggest learning the syntax. These are both YAM going to be YAML files. I'm going to show how they're structured in a second. But you want to give states and bins for both of these. And the output is going to be another HDF file with uh, every data point assigned. Uh, and this construct data set is actually the exact same construct data set that we've used for the WP list. So you can give it any arbitrary data set that you want to bin. So this is the nicest thing about this one, say for example you run simulation and then you realize there's an orthogonal coordinate because your simulation gets stuck or something along those lines. And you figure out, oh, maybe this particular um, progress coordinate is important. So you can actually crawl over the data set just like Matt mentioned with the W crawl tool. You can put them in, a, in an H5 file and you can feed it into this to see what the rates would be, for example. Um, stuff like this makes this tool really, really um, really, really flexible. I've implemented multiple tools off of this uh, file alone. So if you want to actually do an analysis, a custom analysis that uses some form of assignment, this is, you can write it off of the file that's going to be printed, uh, that's going to be uh, written off of this. That would be my suggestion at least. So this is a sample um, command line version of this. So I have two, um, I think I renamed this to .yaml files because it wasn't doing the syntax highlighting. But this is the same uh, function that I'm actually feeding yet that I've that I've talked about before. So uh, first, I'm going to really quickly mention what the YAML files look like. Um, basically, they're just dictionaries. It's a very common uh, it's a very common file format. If you want, you can actually open up the YAML file uh, specifications. But basically, all you need to do is give it um, an, an actual uh, option called bins, and then it takes in a type and boundaries. The the, the actual mechanism behind this is a little uh, is a little um, lengthy to actually explain. So right now I'm only going to go with the identity bin mapper, which gets you the Cartesian coordinates of multiple dimensions, if you want, and I'm going to stick with that for now. Um, this gets you basically a bin, bin bound, and then you give bin boundaries in a single dimension. This is a one D one that I'm going to show first. Can you go over what these bin boundaries mean? Uh, the zero and two, you know, mm -hmm. where those, where oh, the, um, why you have an infinity mm -hmm, yeah. term um, there. Yeah. So this is going to be, I'm going to use this over the RMST metric that we looked at, and if you remember, basically two was about the folded structure, and beyond six, as I mentioned before, was about, uh, was like really unfolded. I'm going to show you the actual structures later on, but it was actually unfolding the, the alpha helix, unraveling the alpha helix. So uh, I'm going to calculate everything from between 0 and 2, and I'm going to calculate the rate into this bin over here, which is between 6 and everything above. The infinity is a catch-all thing. If you, don't, if you know that like, your RMAC is going to be less than 1,000 or 10,000 or something, you can plot, plot that in. But infinity can, well, of course, catch everything. Um, so basically, if you gave it multiple dimensions, it would just get the Cartesian product of everything. So the state definitions is... Um, this one's a this one's actually really really nice, but it can uh, it can trip you up a little bit. So I'm going to actually explain what's going on with this one. You want to give in a separate file. You can want to give um, an option called states, and then you can enumerate the number of states that you want. First, you have an, a label, and then you have some coordinates. So what this coordinate is supposed to do is that you have to give it a coordinate that's supposed to fit 
pull into the bin that you want the state to be in. So what do I mean by that? If you want the state to be between 0 and 2, you want to give bin boundaries of 0 and 2, and you want to give it a coordinate that will fall between 0 and 2. Because underneath what it's doing, it's actually assigning it into a bin and takes, taking the index out and using that index to say, OK, this is a state. Uh, why is this important? Because throughout the entire uh, simulation, it will actually track the state. So then you can get court conditional, uh, conditional probability classes and stuff like that. So uh, I basically kind of arbitrarily called it native and unfold. This is going to be falling in between 6 and infinity. And the first one's going to call between 0 and 2. And those are going to be my two states. And there's going to be a catch-all uh, in intermediate between 3. Um, so I just want to quickly show you an example of the two-dimensional one as well. And it's basically giving two dimensions. This is, the second one is going to be over the end-to-end -end distances. And I'm going to calculate, as I said before, I'm going to calculate somewhere uh, two, two bins between uh, two and three, and I'm going to choose two different end-to-end -end distances, those two bins that were top, on, top and bottom. And I'm going to give the first dimension two and a half falls in here, and 25 this is going to fall into here. Um, and two and, two, and, two and a half again, falls into here, 20 falls into there. So those are going to be two different bins, and I'm going to calculate the rates between them. They're really close. The rate should be really high. And in the other case, the probability was really low on the um, right-hand side of that 6R six, six and angstrom out of SD. So it should, the rate should be low for that one. Um, and finally, the two other tools that will actually be used um, for the rate calculation. Once you run WSI, it's going to give you the assigned file. You're going to feed the assigned file into the kinetics. Uh, this has multiple modes, but the one that I'm going to talk about is the tracing mode. It will actually actively trace every single trajectory and where it goes. It's going to calculate the probability of the fluxes into the states that you have defined. And then you're going to have um, a kinetic study H5, which only has the probability of fluxes for every duration, which then is going to get fed into the WKIN average, again, with the tracing mode. Um, it's going to take in the main uh, H5 file, assignment, kinetics, and then finally is going to output averaged probability fluxes. And, out, and from this output, it will also output a, a, standard, into the, a standard output. It will also output the rates, which looks something like that. I simplified it a little bit, but um, once you run WSIN and W um, kinetics and W kin average, you're going to see something like this in your uh, standard output. If you don't want to do this by hand, you can run the second part, VESPA Analysis Tools Part 2, and it will also immediately spit out two separate ones. The first one is going to be the one-dimensional one, uh, and the second one is this two-dimensional one. Um, so this is the one-dimensional one result. And what it's basically saying is that the, the first, the, this first section gives you the total flux into each state. So it doesn't care where it's coming from. It doesn't calculate. It's not a conditional flux. The, say, the other two is going to be the fluxes and the rates of the of, uh, conditional rates from native on, into unfold. There's a um, there's a the, also mind you this is this is in inverse tau units. So if you want to get it in seconds, you have to convert from tau to seconds. And if you have more than um, if you have second order process, for example, you would have uh, uh, do the concentration kind of correction, for example. But basically, you then have the rate constants between states. The rates here is basically normal is normalized by the probability within that state. So it's the flux is divided by the probability from where it's coming from. So it's basically this guy divided by the native probability. So um, I want to finally talk about extracting trajectories. Um, I don't know why I did this. I thought it was going to. I thought it was cool. It's just a GIF of the trajectory. Um, so this basically is the full file tree. Um, it's just a very simple for the four iterations of weighted ensemble. You have you're starting from a basis state. You're falling down. You're splitting into two, and then you're merging into here, and then you have a straight falling down here. This is of course not representative of real weighted ensemble simulation. It's just a cartoon. Um, but each trajectory is going to have one history parent only. So either one of these is going to actually have the history. The, other one is basically going to die off at, the, at that point. Its history is going to die off. So it's basically going to look something like this. So in each case, tracing down is a little difficult because you have a bunch of branches, but tracing up is very easy because you only have one parent at all times. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace this guy up, and I'm going to follow it up until, until I hit the parent in the beginning.
And what is your numbering corresponding to? Oh. The one, one, two, one. So they're just arbitrary. Yeah, those are just arbitrary segment indexes, just like, for example, weighted ensemble would call it. So iteration one, segment one, iteration two, segment one, segment two, iteration three, one, two, three, so on and so forth. They're just arbitrary indexes that are used for uh, the internal um, bookkeeping. Book um, WTrace does that for you. W it, it, the only option that it really needs is the H5 file, the main H5 file, which contains all the parent-child relationships which you can write a simple tool to do this manually. It basically just goes in, finds this, finds the child, and traces back up as, as you go up in iterations. So I chose 77 iterations because that's the one that I had at the time. And 399 has a very particular number. It's the highest RMSD that I had at that particular point. So I chose that one so that I can show you guys the highest RMSD that the simulation got to. Um, and the output is going to look something like that. This is, again, is going to be outputted into a file that is automatically named, it's going to be called trash, uh, the iteration number uh, and the Volker number, not txt. You can change that in the, in, the, in the tools, but I never had to, so I just didn't want to particularly show that. Um, this actually outputs a bunch of different uh, useful information. The main two I'm going to be using is these two columns. It's going to be the iteration number and the segment ID. Again, the segment ID is an arbitrary name, numbering scheme. Um, then you have um, weights if you want to do anything with the weights. It actually outputs the coordinate, um, the progress coordinates, which is really nice, by the way. You can actually import this into, um, for example, the plotting tool, plotting hook that I mentioned, and actually plot these pro pro progress coordinates as the simulation goes along. So you can actually plot paths into on on top of your on top of your plots, for example. That's that's one use that you can do use this for. Um, but then I also have in my um, in my, in my tutorial, there's a really kind of hefty back script uh, that actually pulls files out of this, out of the history that you just extracted. So uh, I basically, this is, this is the way that I do it. You can do it in any, other, in, in any way you want. This is just an example. Um, this one is going to crawl over the entire file that you had. It's going to pull segment and iteration. It's going to copy, find the HTC files, which is the Chrome Access coordinate files, and it's going to put them in a f single file, and eventually, actually, at the end, I stitch it together as well. So what this is doing, it's starting from iteration one, looping over everything. It, it's plotting, the, it's, it's printing out the first and second column. I'm going to convert that and pad them with zeros, and I'm going to finally construct the full path. Um, and from the full path, I just copy the HCCN. I don't want to talk too much about it. I just wanted to show you what that looks like. That's all. Um, and finally, OK. Uh, finally, <laughs> this was supposed to have Trash, trash Cat, uh, which is a tool, Chromax tool, that stitches together XCC files. Because I named it correctly, it's going to actually, when you do, I don't know if I can get it back. Can you go but, forward? That worked for me. Can you go back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I, I basically only do star XTC. It actually, because the naming, naming is, is consistent, it's going to have uh, 0 to whatever iteration that I have, or 1 to 77 iterations. And it's going to stitch together from 1 until the end. And you're going to have one big HTC file that you can actually visualize. If you want, you can open up VMD uh, from, because it's forwarding is enabled, you can actually open up VMD. And I have supplied you with the initial grow file and the XCC file. If you know how to use VMD, you can actually visualize the trajectory that I'm going to show you. And if you don't want to use it, you can just look at the movie that I'm going to make, uh, that I'm going to show you. Oh, there we go. Huh, there we go. So this is basically the, um, the, particular, the particular path to the highest RMSD uh, point by iteration 77, which was about 8.3, I think, 8.6, or something along those lines. Uh, so what it does, if you recall, it was kind of like a anti-correlated. So higher the RMSD, the closer the endpoints were. So you can see the uh, alpha helix unfolds and eventually ends come together, and that's it. Yeah, and this is an explicit solvent. Yes. So you you've left out all the waters yes. just for clarity yeah. here. But, so this this is a lot of sampling. Yes. Explicit solvent. This 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 has all the solvent molecules. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much.